Here I'm going to go through the seventh FRQ. The free response question this is an IB paper style two question. It's mostly on stoichiometry with a couple other things mixed in. If you want to try the problem first, you can go ahead and find the link to this Google Doc in the description below. Uh, and then you can come check the solution here. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a copper two sulfate solution. We do not know the concentration of it. So we're going to try and find that and we're going to use a spectrophotometer and some standard solutions to do that. So we collected some data on absorbance and concentration. And we're going to use that to figure out what our unknown concentration is by what its absorbance is and how it kind of falls into these three. So before we get into that, we start off with some background stuff on uh, complex ions and, and color. And so it says explain how the copper two ions are able to produce a colorful solution. So we're looking at copper two plus. Now copper metal has 4s239 or 4s1310 is a little more accurate uh, for its electron configuration. The electron configuration for this, after it's had the 4s electron removed and one of the d electrons is 3d9. Uh, and the 3s2, 3p6 and all the preceding things would fall before that. If we look at the 3D9, usually we draw d orbitals where we have five, all of the same energy, or degenerate. We fill in our nine electrons, each electron being represented by an arrow with its spin being up or down. When you put copper two ions that have this configuration into solution, something happens to them. And the reason for that is because d orbitals have a complex shape to them. They have two nodes on each d orbital, so this is, this is one orbital. Uh, and then there's the one that has the weird donut kind of thing around it, and there are a few more of these in different directions. When you surround this ion by ligands, uh, or in this case, so we're putting this in water, we're just, what we're going to have happen is the water molecules are going to surround this. And when they surround it, they're going to interact with different orbitals differently. And that's going to cause them to not all be the same energy anymore. Instead, what we're going to see happen is some of them are going to go higher in energy, some lower, based on their interactions with that water. So they're going to split. And they might split into two on top, three on the bottom. They might have three higher in energy, two lower. That depends on how many things surround them. But the key idea here is that these five orbitals are going to go from being the same energy to a split, where the electrons can then move between those two levels. So if we fill in our nine electrons now, we now have a space where one of these lower energy d orbitals states can, can have an electron turn into one of the higher energy ones, and then re, re, return back to that original state, emitting light in the process. Okay, So the key thing here is that this energy gap is on par with visible light. And so when the visible light comes in, if we have white light, one particular wavelength is going to get absorbed, and then re-emitted in random directions, and so we're going to not see that color make it through the solution. It's going to get absorbed by the solution, and so instead of seeing white light coming through, we're going to see the white light minus that particular type of light. And so, and so we're going to see a colorful solution. Now, in our case here, we see a blue solution. So in part two here, it says, use the color wheel in the data booklet to figure out what wavelength we should be running. That's asking which wavelength is getting absorbed. So if we go to the data booklet on the IB site, or from the IB data booklet, we see that the blue is complementary to orange. What that means is if we're seeing the blue, that the orange light is what's being absorbed. And orange is in the wavelength of 650 to 585. So it says what wavelength will we, will we want to check? We'd want to be looking in that range. Now, there's probably going to be a single peak wavelength that we can use that'll be better than the other ones in there, probably somewhere in uh, probably somewhere, somewhere in this range, so it's 600 or 620 or 640, uh, there'll be a particular wavelength. We don't know what that is without running the spectrophotometer, but we can then go back and we can answer that question and say, well, we would want to run it in that range, and we could choose 600 nanometers as our wavelength that we could use to run. Alright, next, it says, make a calibration curve, determine the unknown concentration. That's looking at this data here, so we're looking at these three concentrations of our standards. 
and we're looking at how much light they absorb at a particular wavelength. It doesn't say what that wavelength is, so it doesn't clue away number two. And then our unknown has an absorbance that falls in the midst of those three values. So the question then is, where, what is the concentration of that? Now, to figure that out, what we're going to do is we're going to plot the calibration curve. Now, I've already done that over here. So in red here, you can see the three data points. Those are my standard solutions. And they're very linear, so I got a really, really easy line of best fit to draw. I used a ruler. Then I put my absorbance up for what my unknown was. It was 0.52, so, so a little under halfway between 0.50 and 0.55. I traced that over to the line. I traced that down to here. And then I found my concentration. Okay. Now, it is possible to actually get an equation for this line and then use that to plug in to get a little more accurate. But, given the number of sig figs we're dealing with in this particular question, uh, the way I did this is, is perfectly reasonable and fine. So, I ended up with an answer of 0 0.018 molar, which would be 0 0.018 moles of copper sulfate, copper 2 sulfate, per liter of solution. So that would be my answer to 3A from that calibration curve that I constructed. Then in B, it says, well, now that you figured what the concentration is, let's ask you a question about the amount. So this says we now have 18 centimeters cubed. We let it uh, evaporate all the water so it's completely dry. Uh, how much will be there after that? So our given here is this 18.0 centimeters cubed. That's 18 milliliters. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this as a conversion factor with this. So a thousand centimeters cubed is one liter. And then the one liter is equivalent to 0 0.018 moles of copper sulfate. Okay, so I'm using the concentration as a conversion factor to change volume into amount of chemical. And then lastly, I'm going to change that to moles, or from moles to grams. Molar mass is 159.62 grams of copper sulfate. Okay, so if I multiply this times this times this, divide by 1,000, I'll get how many grams of copper sulfate that is, copper 2 sulfate. And it turns out to be 0 0.052 grams. Okay, which is not a lot, but we didn't start with a lot. We started with a tiny amount of volume, 18 milliliters to that ton. So, in number four, then it says, while this is evaporating and drying, the copper 2 sulfate color changes from blue to white. So, what, what's happening that's causing that color change? What ligand is going away? That draws back from our original, our original uh, question one, I believe, uh, that the copper 2 plus had been surrounded by water molecules where the lone pair on the water was interacting with the copper too. So the ligand that's leaving, that's causing this color change to go from blue to white, is the water, of course. And, and as that happens, we're seeing those d orbitals return to a degenerate state where they're all five are equivalent, as opposed to being split where, where two and three are, are different from each other. The last question on here is another concentration question. So this one, we no longer need the information from above. It gives us an amount of copper 2 sulfate, 0 0.0010 moles. And we add it to 1.1 kilograms of water. It says find the concentration in parts per million. So parts per million, if you're not familiar with parts per million, is going to be how many grams of solute there are if you had had a million grams of solution. Now often you won't, so what we're going to do in this case where we don't have a million grams of solution, we're going to create a proportion to figure out what it would have been. Um, so first we need to figure out how many grams of copper 2 sulfate we have. We have a thousandth of a mole, so we're going to have 0.16 uh, grams. I'm just taking that 
0.001 times the molar mass, and I'm, I'm rounding because I only have two sig figs to work with, and I have 1.1 kilograms of water, which is 1,100 grams. Now, I'm going to go ahead and use that as my grams of solution. Uh, technically, I would have this added to it, but since this only has the sig fig in the hundreds place, adding 0.16 is really not relevant to that. Uh, it's kind of like you have so much money, you add a quarter, how much do you have? Well, you kind of still have what you had in the first place. Um, because we don't really know exactly what we have here in this, we have a range. So we're going to set up a proportion where we say, well, what if I had a million grams of solution? Then how many grams of copper sulfate? I have this many in 1,100 grams. In a million, I would take this divided by this times this, and then x ends up being 145 parts per million.